A new car designed and built in East Anglia was officially born today. From now on, this car belongs to the salesman. The men who made it had their big day three months ago on the production line of the Lotus factory at Hethel in Norfolk. The champagne was out to celebrate the first production model of a new generation of Lotus cars, and to no one can the wine have tasted sweeter than Colin Chapman. Chapman, founder, chairman and chief designer of Lotus cars, was breaking new ground. His name and that of Lotus have dominated motor racing for many years. He's also established a reputation as a master builder of high-performance glass fiber sports cars. But this was his first full four-seat car. When it all began more than three years ago, Chapman knew just what he wanted. Really the objective was to produce a new car, which was an extension to our existing range of cars. Uh, we wanted to build a four place. Uh, we wanted to aim for very luxurious standards of accommodation and, and uh, very high performance, but not necessarily with a big engine and high fuel consumption and high cost, which tended to be associated with the, the larger of the specialist cars. Um, we'd always had a very good concept of uh, backbone chassis with uh, a reinforced plastic body. Uh, we'd now got a new 16-valve, two-liter engine, which made, would make an ideal power plant for a car um, of the type we had in mind. The engine was codenamed the 907. Built entirely in Norfolk, it proved so successful that Lotus are now exporting it to another car firm, Jensen Healy. Project M50 was the label they put on Chapman's idea and it really got underway as a result of an informal meeting at the factory one Saturday morning back in 1971. Why don't we try something more on the style of a, of a shooting brake, but not really a shooting brake. In other words, we'll go for a, a rear end which gives us more head clearance. It'll give us a nice side window um, visibility. It'll give us a reasonable boot capacity and then we can get our our uh, discreet uh, luggage apart compartment with a, a rear window in the back there. Yeah, rear end which gives us more head clearance. It'll give us a nice side window um, visibility. It'll give us a reasonable boot capacity and then we can get our, our uh, discreet uh, luggage apart compartment with a, a rear window in the back there. Yeah. Uh, it'll, that'll combine to give us a reasonably high scuttle to get over this enormous engine that uh, Tony's given us that we've got to bury under the front here somewhere and we can still get a good side window. Yeah. Well, what can we do about the, t the, the engine, Tony? You know, we really have getting a bit of a job getting yeah, over Yeah, well, it isn't a thumping great engine. It's the brake master cylinder which sits up here which fixes your scuttle. Yeah. Tony Rutt, Lotus Engineering Director, personal friend of Chapman, and a man who came from BRM with a brilliant reputation as a designer of engines. It's always the same problem with the various designers all fighting for the same piece of uh, space. It generally falls to my lot to arbitrate. Uh, we had a case in point where uh, the three designers, the body designer, uh, was after a piece of space to put the passenger's feet. The chassis designer wanted it for the chassis and the engine designer thought he would probably want it for an exhaust pollution device. Uh, one solution was to breed a special race of passengers. Um, that we rejected as taking too long and I took the rather brave decision that the engine would be good enough not to need this bolt-on exhaust pollution device and the uh, passenger's feet won. Unfortunately it all worked out, the engine didn't need the device. Uh, we then uh, went on and arranged all the components on the drawing board in the position they would have to be, or we thought they'd have to be, uh, to meet the various laws. Uh, headlamps, windscreen wipers, seatbelt anchorages, etc. The result was a very ordinary looking, uninspiring motor car. As the design progressed and we uh, started to make quarter scale models, uh, it became clear to us that uh, we'd overdone the aerodynamic efficiency and although the car uh, had a very low drag factor, it was a little too much like an aeroplane 
and had considerable lift, in fact dangerously so, on the rear wheels. So we rearranged the program and did the wind tunnel testing earlier than we intended and confirmed our fears. So we had to go back again and completely reshape the back end of the body, which involved the passenger compartment, uh, arrangement of petrol tank, and uh, a complete carve up of the back end of the car. So Project M50 went literally back to the drawing board where the final shape began to evolve. It owed much to the Lotus racing history. It was low and sleek. The track was unusually wide for maximum road holding and the wedge shape profile was to ensure that this time the M50 would have no tendency to fly. But the shape did present some problems to the styling manager, Ollie Winterbottom. The problem was getting a different style with plenty of space inside it. And the biggest problem with this sort of car was getting the rear passenger's head into the car, so we took the roof straight through to the back, rather like a station wagon. Combining that with a dropping front and a great thick wedge line right through the middle, where we joined the body together. In fact, the M50 body shell is made in two halves, but that's about the only information you're likely to get. The rest of the process was, and still is, a closely guarded secret. By the end of 1971, the minutely engineered quarter-scale models enabled the car men to see their plans one stage nearer reality. No, no problem. What about the aerodynamics of it on the basic test? Did you get any decent results? Yes, they were very promising. Uh, I think we've got a lot more work to do on the radiator ducts and the outlet here and the arrangement underneath here, but broadly speaking, very promising indeed. It seems to be a very stable car, probably as a result of the mass of the back end yeah. we talked in the first place. We took the model for aerodynamic testing and although it was extremely good and very stable at all speeds we felt that a spoiler at the front would be a useful addition to cut down the lift at the front by a further 50%. We'd already achieved a 50% drop over the previous model which had been rejected because of the lift and in fact what happens is that the air hits the front of the spoiler and forces the nose of the car down then diverts it through the radiators and out of the louvers at the top, filling an area which tends to be something of a vacuum. The first prototype M50 was completed towards the end of 1972. Now, for the first time, the men responsible for Project M50 were able to judge whether or not an investment of more than three quarters of a million pounds was going to pay off. This was the moment when Chapman had to take the big decision, whether or not to commit the factory to the full production of M50. He did. By the beginning of 1974, the production lines were in full swing. But as the tempo quickened, events far away were affecting the whole of British industry. The energy crisis and the three-day week had arrived. At first, Lotus weren't really concerned. Their policy of making as much of their own equipment as possible meant they were unaffected by shortages hitting other firms. But eventually, even Lotus were hit. Supplies of small things like windscreen posts began to dry up. Fortunately, it's affected us less than most because um, our policy really in coming to, to Norfolk was not necessarily to build more cars, but to build more of them. 
We wanted to build a plant where we could make our own bodies, our own chassis, our own engines, our own gearboxes, our own trim and so on. But of course, unfortunately, there are still one or two that can hold us up and we are having a little bit of problems at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, I think in the long run, this energy shortage or the energy crisis might be a, a bit of a, an advantage to us in a way because we are offering a prestige car which um, <clears throat> has very high miles per gallon, very low fuel consumption and therefore is perhaps a lot less antisocial than some of the bigger engine and larger uh, old-fashioned, shall we say, prestige cars. Despite restrictions imposed by the economic situation, production of M50s continued. At regular intervals now, body shells were leaving the top secret moulding shop for an almost clandestine journey across the factory to the assembly line. The men on the line had been building glass fibre sports cars for years, but now they had to learn a whole new set of skills for a new car. To train key men, a kind of car building school was set up on the production line. One of the teachers was the chief engineer, Mike Kimberley. You line it up, good. Ready? Right. Bring it across. <laughs> Careful you don't touch the prepared surface. But down onto the edge of the clip. Now another thing that quality control and assembly must make sure of is that this filler cap has got to be fitted so that the flute lies up absolutely parallel to ground. Okay Ron? Now yes. you notice on this one, Alan can you see that? On this one, it's running down at something like 10 to 15 degrees. Now, it's important from a visual aspect that we get that correct. Now, why isn't this one fitted correctly? Well, the rubber neck from the sink is, in fact, very stiff. Yes. And it is very difficult to get at. And the, the rubber does tend to push the filler neck right. out of line. Now, you're achieving it on some cars, but not on others. In fact, there were many snags to be ironed out before the production line was running smoothly, for not only was the M50 a new car, it incorporated a number of new design features. Half the Lotus output is exported to countries like the United States, where climatic extremes demand sophisticated heating and air conditioning equipment, so the M50's cooling system is particularly advanced. Instead of copper, the radiator is made of bonded aluminium. It's cheaper, and there's no chance of copper deposits or damaging chemical reactions in the engine block. Lotus have a long tradition of being among the first firms to conform with American federal regulations on car safety. Take what the Americans call the fender. The US version of the M50 breaks new ground by having molded plastic fenders. Not only are they stronger and lighter than ordinary bumpers, they conform to American regulations by bouncing back to their original shape after an impact. Despite the policy of independence where possible, Lotus often buy in materials and talent when necessary. With the body shape and engineering decided, Ford's turn to the interior. Chapman recalled meeting the Italian designer Giorgetto Grigero at the Geneva Motor Show. The result was a quick phone call to Turin and Guigero was invited to create seats and fittings to match the new shape. And now the marketing men were laying plans. Former marketing manager Barry Carter. Our research showed us that there was a very definite niche in the marketplace for a car between three and a half and five thousand pounds for the man who is 40 to 55 years of age, uh, is probably a company director or certainly a senior manager in an outfit, and who required a car for his children, who a man of that age obviously would be in the 16 to 19 off to college age group, and he would be a man who would normally like to drive himself rather than be driven by a chauffeur. We needed to combine safety and economy, two most important things in the design of motor cars today, and ally them to performance and comfort, two other very 
very uh, rigorous factors that many of our um, competitors in markets overseas have been able to beat us to the punch on, in fact, and I think this shows in the registrations that we have seen in the British market today. And we felt that it was about time we had another British car in that, in that group. By early 1974, detailed marketing and advertising plans were being drawn up. We're really going up about 10 years in our current uh, model. We, to date, we've always been with our kit cars for the younger people and for the more serious-minded and mature man with the plus two. But we believe that that man now is in need of a four-seat car because the two little kids he had are now big enough and old enough to need long legroom in the back, which this new motor car we sincerely trust has got for us all. And so to an English country house went the M51 chilly winter morning. The photographers, the carefully chosen models and the men with the bucket and sponge were about to create an image. image that would appear on thousands of brochures, advertisements and handout photographs was distinctly upper crust, an image that befits a car in the £5,000 range. And at last Project M50 was given a name. To find it, Chapman went back to the early days of Lotus to a highly successful sports car and the M50 became the second elite. Now a slogan, join the elite. Oh, there we are. You see, that, that captures it beautifully. That really is, that's superb for an outside back shot. What do you Originally, think it had been planned to launch the Elite in March, but the three-day week meant Lotus couldn't complete a large enough reserve of cars to meet all demands. Eventually, the launch had to be postponed. Promotion, but later on. And while that may have been bad news for some, it gave the engineers time to carry out even more tests to make sure the Elite was competitive. In charge of the test program was Mike Kimberley. Well, there are so many thousands of regulations in the world at the moment, c covering, for example, in America, this amount, which include everything from pendulum bumpers to emission control laws, and there are special ones involved in those which require special equipment to be built in this country to meet the regulations before you can even test, obviously. And it's not just the US, it's also European regulations, which is this great stack here. These include certain ones such as safety belt anchorages, which aren't accepted by the UK government, but are required by the European governments. Again, you have to make special equipment to test, you have to get observers over from the government, etc. For example, Italy requires a different tail light arrangement from the rest of the European countries. This elite, the first journey was a one-way trip. It was tested to destruction at the Motor Industry Research Centre. Less dramatic forms of testing continued in Britain and on a number of occasions in rather more exotic locations. As the development progressed and we had uh, prototypes that we could run, I used to take it for a weekend to Monte Carlo, leaving the factory Friday evening catching either the 7 o'clock hovercraft or the uh, 8 o'clock ferry and having a meal on board, getting to Arras, staying the night, starting out the next morning at 7, getting to Monte Carlo between 4 and 4.30, which involves putting 300 miles into three hours. Uh, then I used to turn around at Monte Carlo, drive to Marseille, stay the night. Uh, sometimes uh, I'd fit a modification of the car or change a setting and drive it back and it was also very useful because there's a stretch of road just north of Marseille which is very badly affected by crosswinds and I was able to confirm on that stretch doing about 120 that we had in fact got the aerodynamics right and the car was very stable at these speeds and if all went well I used to be able to get back to Calais about five o'clock for the five o'clock boat and be home here at ten o'clock uh, not tired at all quite enjoyed it and had quite a few good French meals in the bargain but most of the testing was still being carried out in strict secrecy around Hethel. White 72 to air call. We have an ETA of 12 o'clock. Could you alert base, please? 
Y72 standing by. Teams of factory engineers were driving an elite hard night and day for thousands of miles around East Anglian Road to spot any faults before hundreds of customers. What about that, uh, that clutch? Is that uh, still a bit it's, it's a bit heavy, but it's still OK. Yeah. We're still going with it. Yeah, OK. Uh, we'll have to change the two rear tyres, though. Yeah, well, I've got, yes, I've got that. Um, what about this? This fuel consumption on this thing, it's still pretty good, you know, it's 20, 26 to the gallon, so yeah. got any problems there. Every few thousand miles, the test car went into the factory for a fresh crew and a thorough check. Obviously, one of the most important things is to keep an eye on the performance of the car. And this includes fuel and oil consumption. And the handling of the car to ensure that as you get wear in certain bushes that you don't get any reduction in the handling. Also, noise levels is another very important factor. And one must ensure that the noise level inside the car as well as outside, remains constant at the specified standards. By the end of March this year, the printers were delivering the first glossy sales brochures. But these weren't the only pictures of the elite in circulation. The motoring press still loves an old-fashioned scoop, and the news that Colin Chapman had a new car was more than enough to whet their appetites. Despite strict security at Lotus, the January edition of Car had somehow got hold of a very accurate drawing of the Elite. One month later, the same magazine had snapped a prototype Elite parked briefly in a Norwich street. But the day of the rumours and leaks was nearly done, for by March the Elite was coming under the official scrutiny of the motoring correspondents, among them the doyen of motoring journalism, John Bolster. The appearance of the Elite is very attractive indeed, simply because it's functional. This wedge shape, for example, that is to, to produce an air pressure to hold the tyres down onto the road. The whole car is designed with that sort of idea in mind. Well, the gear lever's in the right place, and so is the steering wheel. And the pedals are just exactly where I want them. The windscreen, it's at a very considerable angle in order to reduce the wind resistance as much as possible, of course, but it isn't excessively inclined, which of course would give you a certain amount of distortion, uh, especially at night. Well, let's see how she goes. She's just going nicely into her stride, 100 miles an hour, 110, and we're, we're coming down to a right-hand curve, braking a little. We, we're getting very comfortably around this right-hand curve, sliding a little, but completely under control, picking up speed. Still in third gear, and in the top. Coming down now. We're about 300 yards from a very sharp and slow corner. 200 yards and I'm on the brake. Braking hard. Slipping down into third. Into, into second. I'm going to slide this one. It's now all four wheels sliding beautifully. Well, we're not really just setting out to produce transportation. Um, so if people really just want to get from A to B, uh, then the, the mini miner will do the job as well as anything else. What I think we're trying to do is to put some fun into motoring. And the people who, who have to motor in their business or for pleasure um, want to enjoy themselves, want a car that is light, responsive and efficient, above all efficient. And we think we can get all the fun back into motoring by building a light car with a fairly small engine and making it so it handles very nicely, it stops nicely, it purrs along nice and sweetly, it has a gearbox that is a pleasure to use um, and can make, uh, make it interesting. Also, of course, 
we want to sell the car as a prestige product. There's no doubt about it that people want to own something different. Um, there's a, so many cars on the road, there's so much alike. Um, there will always be a market for the man who is prepared to spend just a little bit more in order to have something which is uh, a little bit special.